Hi. I am Socrates. Born 470 BC. Credited as the founder of Western philosophy. I have been the first to provide a highly refined argument from design. In my days, the creative power of accidents had, thanks to its advocacy by the automists, emerged as an explanatory model aspiring to compete with intelligent causation. This was why I became the first to argue for the creationist option against the rival materialist hypothesis. Thus this was when the argument from design entered the scene. I attribute to the supreme deity not only benevolence but also powers that make that deity both omniscient and omnipresent. God is so great and of such a kind as at one and the same time to see everything, to hear everything, to be present everywhere, and to take care of everything. Compare things with regard to which there is no sign of what they are for, and things that evidently serve a beneficial purpose. Which ones do you judge to be the products of chance, and which of design? Products of chance typically do not serve a manifest purpose, whereas products of design typically do so. Living beings, here represented by humans, are so structured that their every feature serves some manifest purpose. Therefore that which originally produced living beings, including humans, did so by design. Intelligence is the real cause of everything in the world. I was the first in history to point to the explicit disjunction of accident and design, offered as competing for causal origins of life. The origin of life forms lies in a creator superior to any human creator. My name is Louis Saint-Pierre, philosopher of science. What a great point by Socrates. Whatever exists for beneficial purposes must be the result of reason, not of chance. When we see a higher order system that performs a specific function, a machine, a factory, or a turbine, we know someone made it for a reason. These things are dependent on specified values, mathematical calculations, fine-tuning, calibrated adjustments, and selection of the right materials, often made of several interdependent and interlocked parts that permit the operation of that system in a regular stable manner, guaranteeing the continuity of its function. The complex parts must fit and integrate together. They also must be assembled in the right way. Someone with intelligence and foresight has to conceptualize everything and create a blueprint that instructs how to make these things. We can say with certainty that such complexity is the product of a mind. A term recently popularized is irreducible complexity. Let's hear what Wilkins and Paley, already hundreds of years ago, had to say about it. I am John Wilkins, born in 1614, Anglican clergyman, natural philosopher, an author, and one of the founders of the Royal Society. Now to imagine that the large number of parts of the body and their relationships, all these things, according to their several kinds, could be brought into this regular frame and order, to which such an infinite number of intentions are required, without the contrivance of some wise agent, must needs be irrational in the highest degree. I am William Paley. My watchmaker argument is fully in line with Socrates' observation that functionality is evidence of design. The several parts of a watch are framed and put together for a purpose. They are so formed and adjusted as to produce motion, and that motion so regulated as to point out the hour of the day, that, if the several parts had been differently shaped from what they are, of a different size from what they are, or placed after any other manner, or in any other order, than that in which they are placed, either no motion at all would have been carried on in the machine, or none which would have answered the use, that is now served by it. The inference, we think, is inevitable, that the watch must have had a maker, that there must have existed, at some time and at some place or other, an artificer or artificers who formed it for the purpose which we find it actually to answer, who comprehended its construction and designed its use. Besides my famous watchmaker argument, I made another one against chance, from what I name, relation, a notion akin to what some authors, 200 years later have named, irreducible complexity. When several different parts contribute to one effect, or, which is the same thing, when an effect is produced by the joint action of different instruments, the fitness of such parts or instruments to one another for the purpose of producing, by their united action, the effect, is what I call relation, and wherever this is observed in the works of nature or of man, it appears to me to carry along with it decisive evidence of understanding, intention, art. The outcomes of chance do not exhibit relation among the parts or, as we might say, they do not display organized complexity. 
An eye or a telescope would never arise by chance. In 1859, Charles Darwin submitted a manuscript entitled An Abstract of an Essay on the Origin of Species and Varieties Through Natural Selection to John Murray III, who published the text under the title On the Origin of Species. On many pages of this book, Darwin contrasted his naturalistic theory that explains the transmutation and diversification of animals and plants with the Bible-based belief that all species were independently created. Darwin popularized natural selection. While the idea was not new, going indeed back to Aristoteles, it was through Darwin that the term became widely known. As Darwin claimed, Paley's thesis that the appearance of design must in fact be the outcome of design was refuted by the advent of a workable theory of evolutionary change. Darwin's main tenets challenging and opposing the biblical Genesis account was the claim of universal common ancestry. And the second is that all life forms derive from that ancestor, forming a tree of life. As he wrote, Probably all the organic beings which have ever lived on this earth have descended from some one primordial form, into which life was first breathed. I believe the great tree of life fills with its dead and broken branches the crust of the earth and covers the surface with its ever-branching and beautiful ramifications. The book changed how people started to approach biology and had fundamental impacts on several scientific fields, religion, and other aspects of society. Soon, staunch defenders of the theory emerged on the scene, like Thomas Huxley, called Darwin's bulldog. It has been alleged about me, that I said in at a meeting of the British Association in Oxford in 1860, in a pugnacious defense of evolutionary theory, that six monkeys typing randomly for millions of years could produce all of Shakespeare's texts. The meeting, with Anglican Bishop Samuel Wilberforce present, was an open discussion. I was the most popular man in Oxford for a full four and twenty hours afterward. Wilberforce put forth the classic argument that a watch implies the existence of a watchmaker, in other words such a complex system couldn't have come about by chance. My position has been shared with my colleague, Herbert Spencer, who said. Those who cavalierly reject the theory of evolution, as not adequately supported by facts, seem quite to forget that their own theory is supported by no facts at all. Like the majority of men who are born to a given belief, they demand the most rigorous proof of any adverse belief, but assume that their own needs none. Must we receive the old Hebrew idea, that God takes clay and molds a new creature? Should the believers in special creations consider it unfair thus to call upon them to describe how special creations take place, I reply that this is far less than they demand from the supporters of the development hypothesis. They are merely asked to point out a conceivable mode. Which, then, is the most rational hypothesis? That of special creations which has neither a fact to support it, or that of modification, which is not only definitely conceivable, but is countenanced by the habitudes of every existing organism. We have, indeed, in the part taken by many scientific men in this controversy of law versus miracle, a good illustration of the tenacious vitality of superstitions. Ask one of our leading geologists or physiologists whether he believes in the mosaic account of the creation, and he will take the question as next to an insult. A 150 years have passed since Darwin, Huxley, and Spencer. Obviously, a lot of scientific progress has been made. So where has it led us? Who is right? Partial credit has to be given to those folks that are proponents of evolution. The frequencies of alleles and the gene pool of a population change. Particular groups of organisms have descended from a common ancestor. Like a dog from a wolf. The mechanism responsible for the change required to produce limited descent with modification is mainly pre-programmed selection acting on random variations or mutations. Natural selection has limited action for example up to two random mutations as shown in malaria. But what about the main tenets of evolution? The idea that all organisms have descended from a single common ancestor has not been confirmed. There are significant differences in the three domains of life, and science has unraveled that viruses do definitively not share a common ancestor. Darwin and his followers believe that biocomplexity can be explained by unguided, unintelligent processes, the idea that natural selection acting on random variation, and other similarly naturalistic mechanisms, completely suffice to explain the origin of novel biological forms and the appearance of design in complex organisms, is a pipe dream, a belief not confirmed by the evidence. 
instructional assembly information encoded in 33 genetic and at least 49 epigenetic codes and languages, and at least five signaling networks operating on a structural level in an integrated interlocked fashion are the mechanisms explaining organismal architecture, development, operation, and adaptation, directing the make and control of complex molecular physiological integrated structures and their development. A main distinction between biology and geology is the fact that the structure and material composition of molecular components that are integral part of cells have always a purpose, a function. DNA stores information. ATP synthase is a nanoturbine that makes ATP, the energy currency in the cell. On the other hand, the structure of a rock serves no particular function. Irreducible complexity is a fact. Natural selection does not select for components of a complex system that are useful only in the completion of that much larger system. There is a high degree of internal order that governs the cell's molecular and extracellular organization. All historical, observational, testable, and repeatable examples have demonstrated that instantiating instructional information, as stored in DNA, and operational functionality dictated by this information stored in DNA, come from intelligent sources. Evolution supposedly replaced design to explain biodiversity. But what about the origin of the universe, the laws of physics, the fine-tuning of the laws of physics and the universe itself, the origin of the finely balanced solar system, and in special, the origin of life, where evolution cannot be invoked? The dichotomy still remains intelligence versus chance. If you want more information, check out the links in the description of the video. Thanks for watching and please subscribe.